This is Dr. Hessel uh, generating the uh, podcast for the uh, PGY3 uh, residents on their first uh, rotation on the cardiac surgery service. Uh, this title of this podcast is Interpreting Preoperative Cardiac Studies. I believe it's important for you to review and understand all of the special cardiac studies that uh, patients uh, have had prior to cardiovascular surgery because uh, this information will help guide uh, anesthetic management, uh, included, uh, including expected risks, uh, anesthetic technique, type of monitoring, etc. The reading assignment is in... Uh, uh, Hensley on pages 102 to 9. Um, as uh, far as the ECG, uh, we won't go into any details, but it's important to note what their baseline rhythm is, whether they have uh, QT prolongation, and if they have any baseline ST or T wave abnormalities, and particularly if they have left bundle branch block, because as you know, uh, they are at risk of developing complete heart block when you pass a pulmonary artery catheter. Also note uh, if they are being paced uh, on the ECG. Um, further discussion of the management of patients with pacemakers uh, will be in a, the subject of another podcast. Um, most of our patients will have had at least a transthoracic echocardiogram. Those with endocarditis will often have had a uh, transesophageal. Uh, so on this slide I've summarized uh, some of the highlights which you should uh, pay attention to in regard to the evaluation of the left ventricle, evaluation of the mitral valve, evaluation of the aortic valve, uh, evaluation of the right ventricle, evaluation of the tricuspid valve, evaluation of the pulmonary valve, and evaluation of the aorta. It is important to remember that uh, uh, a normal LV function or the lack of wall motion abnormalities does not uh, preclude uh, at rest, does not preclude the possibility of severe coronary artery disease. Many patients will undergo a stress test and uh, you need to uh, remind yourselves of what this consists of. There are always two components to a stress test. One is the stressor and the other is the monitor that's used to, to assess the effect of the stressor on the heart. There are two forms of stressors. One is exercise and the other is pharmacologic. Exercise is typically on a treadmill using the Bruce protocol, which has seven stages of three minute duration with progressively increasing incline and speed. Uh, occasionally exercise is done on a supine bicycle. Uh, when pharmacologic stress is used, two forms of uh, pharmacologic stressors are used. One is an inotrope vaso uh, chronotrope, such as dobutamine, and the other is a vasodilator. Uh, and there are three different vasodilators that are used. The purpose here is, the purpose of the inotrope and chronotrope is to increase oxygen demand, uh, which may bring out uh, wall motion abnormality or signs of ischemia. The purpose of the vasodilator is to vasodilate uh, uh, the coronary arteries. Um, the normal coronary arteries will increase their blood flow by as much as four or five times, whereas stenotic coronary arteries cannot increase their blood flow, and so there will be a redistribution of flow away from the stenotic vessels uh, into the normal vessels, producing uh, imbalance of uh, uh, flow to the abnormal vessels. 
There are several different monitors that are used to detect evidence of cardiac disease during stress. There are patient symptoms. There are ECG changes. There are changes in the arterial pressure or evidence of pulmonary edema. Another method is by analyzing the echo, transthoracic echo, during the exercise, looking for changes in ejection fraction or development of regional wall motion abnormalities. The ejection fraction should normally rise uh, with uh, exercise, whereas in the presence of ventricular dysfunction or ischemia, it may fall. Another method of assessing effects of ischemia is uh, myocardial perfusion scanning. Uh, uh, two um, agents are using thallium or cardio-specific technetium, and there are two uh, agents that carry this technetium, either cestamibi or tetraphosphamine. Uh, the signs of coronary insufficiency is the development of unequal distribution of the isotope during stress. If an area of the heart has decreased flow both at rest and with exercise, it suggests a fixed defect due to myocardial infarction. On the other hand, if they develop unequal distribution during exercise, it suggests a reversible defect due to ischemia. If defects are present, you should note the location and the extent of the defect. Now, uh, in recent years, many other non-invasive cardiac imaging methods besides uh, contrast imaging have been introduced. These include uh, spec imaging, uh, CT, PET, and MRI. Uh, you can also obtain uh, angiography uh, 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 non-invasively uh, using either CT angio or cardiovascular MRI. Uh, one of the issues always when there are wall motion abnormalities is trying to determine if these are fixed due to necrosis or reversible due to herniation, uh, excuse me, hibernation or stunning. And uh, on this slide, I've summarized the various tests that are used to assess uh, uh, reversibility, uh, namely membrane integrity, mitochondrial function, myocardial metabolism, uh, microvascular integrity, or the presence or absence of scar. Finally, there has been a great expansion of the uh, use of MRI uh, in cardiovascular disease. Uh, Initially, only static imaging was possible, but nowadays using ECG and respiratory gating and the use of various novel imaging techniques such as spin echo and flow velocity encoding, it is possible to get both uh, imaging of blood flow and also of the cardiac structures. Thus, um, the cardiac MRI has innumerable innumerable uh, applications to cardiovascular diagnosis as summarized on this slide. Uh, most uh, notably, uh, evaluation of cardiomyopathy, mass of the ventricles, uh, intraventricular thrombi, uh, coronary artery disease, uh, uh, etc. Next, I'd like to uh, talk about two entities that are commonly uh, used synonymously, but I think uh, are separate. By cardiac catheterization, uh, I refer to the insertion of catheters into the right or left heart and obtaining hemodynamic and oxygen content information and often uh, uh, contrast ventriculography or angiography of the great vessels and vein. By coronary angiography, I refer to imaging the coronary arteries only, although occasionally uh, during uh, coronary angiography, the interventionalist may also uh, uh, generate a aortic angiogram, a left ventricular angiogram, or measure pressures in the left ventricle and the aorta. 
coronary angiogram angiography is traditionally done uh, from the femoral or the brachial arteries, but nowadays it's often done through the radial artery, usually the right radial. Uh, this may complicate placing an arterial line uh, uh, in that radial artery subsequently. The uh, angiographer will then inject contrast into the right and left main coronary arteries separately and into any grafts from previous cabbage surgery using different x-ray views, uh, typically the right anterior oblique and the left uh, anterior oblique views to visualize all of the various coronary arteries. Uh, in interpreting the coronary angio, you should assess evidence of disease in each of the major vessels and their branches. These uh, include the left main, the LAD, the circumflex, the ramus intermedius, and the right. You should also define right versus left dominance, which refers to which vessel gives off the posterior descending coronary artery. Right dominance occurs in about 80% of uh, patients. If a patient has left dominance, then the right coronary artery is not important uh, to revascularize. For each of these vessels, you should first determine the presence of atheroma and its severity, and severity is usually expressed as the percent reduction in diameter and ranges from luminal irregularity to so-called hemodynamically insignificant lesions through hemodynamically significant lesions, which are defined as greater than 50% reduction diameter of the left main or greater than 70% uh, reduction in all other vessels. It is considered severe if it's greater than 90 to 95%, and the extreme is when it's totally occluded. You should also describe the characteristics of this obstruction in terms of its location. Is it in the proximal vessel, the mid-vessel, or distal? And how it relates to the important branches of this vessel. This reflects how much myocardium is at risk. You should also assess the degree of collateral flow into the distal vessel and where this flow comes from. The angiographer may provide some additional information based on intravascular ultrasound or measuring intravascular flow and calculating flow reserve. Remember that a hemodynamically insignificant lesion doesn't mean it's clinically insignificant. Remember that most acute myocardial infarctions occur in vessels that had less than 50% stenosis prior to the acute coronary event. On the next few slides, I have illustrated coronary anatomy and some pictures of coronary angiography. These are duplicated from my lecture on coronary anatomy. This describes the anatomy of the right main coronary artery. And this, the anatomy of the left main coronary artery and its various branches. Finally, let's close talking about cardiac catheterization. There are basically two types, so-called right heart, such as what we do when we place a pulmonary artery catheter, and left heart. Uh, this is typically done retrograde from a systemic artery, but it can also do, be done antegrade by cast, passing a catheter from the femoral vein into the right atrium, and then the inner atrial septum is perforated and the catheter is, trans, is, is passed into the left atrium and then into the left ventricle. Numerous bits of information are provided by cardiac catheterization, including pressure data, oxygen saturation data, uh, measurements of pulmonary and systemic flow, uh, 
performance of contrast ve ventriculograms and contrast angiograms of both the great arteries and the veins, and then calculating vascular resistance, the degree of valve stenosis and regurgitation, and detecting and quantitating, quantifying uh, left to right and right to left shunts. This uh, uh, table is taken from Hensley's book and gives uh, the normal values for pressures uh, and uh, cardiac output, uh, end diastolic volume index, AVO2 difference, and vascular and systemic resistances. During right heart catheterization, I have listed here some of the key measurements, including mixed venous oxygen saturation and whether there's any step up in saturation as one passes from the central veins through the right atrium, right ventricle, and PA. This will detect left to right shunts and their location. Uh, you can also measure pulmonary blood flow uh, and the pressures in the right atrium, the right ventricle, the pulmonary artery, and the wedge pressure. You should note the vascular resistance uh, through the lung. In other words, the pressure difference between the PA mean and the left atrial or pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. This is normally around 5 millimeters of mercury, and the upper limit of normal is 10. If it's elevated, it in indicates increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. You should also calculate pulmonary vascular resistance, um, which is uh, calculated by the difference between, uh, between uh, which is calculated as the pressure difference divided by uh, flow. Uh, if you just use millimeters of mercury and liters per minute, the answer comes out in woods units of millimeters of mercury per liter per minute. This can be converted to the system international units by multiplying by the number 80. I personally recommend that vascular resistance be normalized to body surface area by using flow uh, index to body surface area rather than absolute flow. Uh, cardiac output is commonly measured during cardiac catheterization. This is often used using thermal dilution measurements with a pulmonary artery catheter. But note that this is actually measuring right heart or pulmonary blood flow and only reflects left heart or systemic cardiac output if there is no right to left or left to right shunts. One can also, using quantitative ventriculography, uh, measure left ventricular output. But again, this only reflects systemic cardiac output if there are no left to right shunts and no aortic or mitral regurgitation. Often, they will report FIC cardiac output. This is calculated as oxygen consumption divided by systemic uh, to venous AVO2 difference. Uh, note that uh, oxygen consumption is required to make this calculation, and ideally this should be measured by spirometry, but often the cardiologist simply assume it based on the patient's characteristic, and there, thus the reported FIC cardiac output is only as accurate as this assumption. For left heart catheterization, I have summarized some of the key uh, measurements including the left atrium or left ventricular hemoglobin oxygen saturation, <clears throat> the left atrial pressure, the left ventricular systolic pressure, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure. Note that this is different and often much higher than the minimal, i.e. early diastolic pressure. You can also note the left ventricular ejection fraction and the presence of regional wall motion abnormalities as determined as observed by ventriculography and the pressure in the aorta distal to the aortic valve. Based on these hemodynamic uh, data, uh, one can calculate the severe, the present, one can detect and quantitate the presence of a mitral stenosis and insufficiency and aortic stenosis and aortic regurgitation. Finally, on this slide, I have depicted the angiographic uh, pictures of the left ventricle 
uh, in the RAO and the LAO uh, views indicating the segments that are shown on the ventriculogram. I will send out at a later time uh, study questions.